Ici, c'est Radio-Canada. J'ai commencé à Radio-Canada quand j'avais 14 ans. C'est une longue histoire d'amour, Radio-Canada et moi. CBC was the only channel on television when I was growing up. C'est un icône, c'est un logo que tout le monde connaît. CBC is a cornerstone in people's lives. They rely on it. We're focusing on content and programming that reflect our community. Pour moi, Radio-Canada, ça a toujours été la référence en termes d'information. I think when people think of CBC, there's an immediate trust, which is something that we do not take for granted. It's something that we've built over time. When we resonate in our local communities, we touch the people's hearts. And that's what really is important in our neighborhoods. C'est ça le mandat de Radio-Canada, d'informer les gens d'un océan à l'autre, à l'autre, en anglais, en français, et ici dans les territoires du Nord-Ouest aussi, dans les langues autochtones. Because our environment and our lives and our cultures are so unique to us, we have to be able to tell those stories with the people that live here. Je trouve que c'est magnifique de voir la roue qui tourne. Fait que la fierté, elle s'inscrit vraiment dans le fait d'appartenir à l'histoire. Hello and welcome to CBC Radio Canada's 11th annual public meeting. We're broadcasting live across the country tonight from beautiful Halifax, Nova Scotia. I'm Portia Clark. I'm the host of Information Morning, broadcasting weekday mornings on mainland Nova Scotia. We hope to have a meaningful, fruitful and open discussion tonight about the future of Canada's public broadcaster, specifically around its new strategic plan, the theme of which is taking your stories to heart. Bonjour à tous, mon nom est Karine Godin, je suis animatrice du téléjournal Acadie. I'm the host of an, uh, téléjournal Acadie, we cover all four regions of Atlantic provinces. It's my great pleasure to be here with you tonight and to see everyone gathered here today in Halifax. I would like to highlight the, the presence of the board directors uh, here of Radio-Canada, uh, CBC, uh, the Commissioner for Eth Values and Ethics, and we have our, um, our Ombudsman. I'd like to also uh, uh, highlight the presence of Denise Wilson and Colette Francoeur, who uh, welcome us in their region. We are, today, we're going to cover the major uh, elements of this strategic plan, and indeed, between and we want this to be it, we, an we want this to take us to heart. To have you take on part in the discussion in advance of tonight's meeting, we asked for some questions online around the theme of "Ask Me Anything," and we've already had some questions, so that's where we'll start. And then there will be a portion of the evening where we'll take questions from our audience who's live with us here at Studio 60. You can follow the conversation and ask questions and comment as well on CBC Radio Canada tonight through the hashtags. Hashtag CBCPAM, uh, pardon me, hashtag CBCAPM, and hashtag RCAPM. That's where you'll see that conversation unfold, for example, on Twitter tonight. Donc, on veut vraiment que cette soirée soit le plus interactive possible pour vous. We want this evening to be the most interactive possible for you at home and in the audience. At the end, at the start of this uh, evening, you'll hear questions asked over the last few weeks to the upper management for Radio Canada. They will answer these questions. There'll be a section reserved for the public, but you at home, you can also participate in this discussion with the uh, hashtags reserved for the night. It is indeed CBC APM or RCAPA. And we're anxious to see what and you write. I'd like to begin with a heartfelt acknowledgement that our meeting tonight is taking place on traditional unceded Mi'kmaq territory. Walalin, thank you. We'd like to uh, begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people, are the, our first peoples. Well, it's important to uh, highlight this. To tonight, we are welcoming our president and CEO, Catherine Tate. Welcome back to Halifax, Catherine. Also, the chair of CBC Radio Canada's board of directors, Michael Goldblum, is with us as well. Welcome. The Executive Vice President of CBC is Barbara Williams, and the Executive Vice President at Radio Canada is Michelle Bissonnette. Please do give them a very warm welcome to Halifax. <laughs> and I'd like to give the floor, first of all, to the Chair of the CBC Radio Canada Board of Directors, 
Michael Goldblum. Thank you, Michael, for being here. Thank you, Portia. Uh, merci, Kevin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in Halifax for our annual public meeting, and welcome to everyone who is joining us online. Merci d'être avec nous. Thank you for being with us, either uh, in person or online. This is our 11th annual public meeting, and it is particularly special since it enables us to host you in one of our own studios. This meeting is also quite special because it is taking place uh, just very brief, uh, soon after the launch of our new strategic plan. To hold this annual public meeting because we've just launched our new three-year strategic plan. This is an important opportunity for us to share our plans with you and to hear from you about your expectations and aspirations for CBC Radio Canada. My colleagues and I who serve on the board are very aware of how important our public broadcaster is to Canadians. Now this is especially true at a time of significant disruption for the media, which is, in our view, placing a particular responsibility on our public broadcaster to fulfill its mandate to inform, enlighten, and entertain Canadians. It is critical that our public broadcaster remains an autonomous and reliable source of news and information for Canadians, which reflects the diversity of our country. CBC Radio Canada plays many roles in the lives of our communities. It's a trustworthy source of news, a committed presence in local storytelling, and an engine for creativity and diversity in Canadian programming. Now, one of the key roles of the Board of Directors is to work with our President, Catherine Tate, and her senior management team in determining the strategic direction for the corporation. And under the leadership of our board colleague, Ted Boyd, that has been a critical focus for the board over the last several months. The new strategic plan establishes priorities that will allow CBC Radio Canada to stay vibrant and relevant and it will allow us to strengthen our position as a world leader in public broadcasting. It will also help us serve Canadians better from all over the country and in every region. I am very proud and happy to be here with my uh, fellow members of the, of the board. Several of them are with us tonight, and I will ask them to introduce themselves. It's in alphabetical order, and we're starting with Guillaume. Thank you for this warm welcome to Halifax. My name is Guillaume Agnorte. I'm a member. I'm in Montreal. I'm a, I've been on the board for a year since 90, 1996. It's been in digital media. Uh, I've also had the opportunity to create and run a company for youth content on interactive and digital platforms. Over the past five years, I've been supporting uh, startups on the international scene and startups in terms of the challenge that that digital uh, elements uh, c contribute to uh, things tonight. And I'm very proud to be well, here you. with everyone. My name is Ted Boyd. I am a marketing and technology entrepreneur based in Toronto. And I'm delighted to be in this beautiful city of Halifax tonight for this important meeting. Thank you. Hello, my name is Suzanne Gevremont. I am the executive. I work in visual effects, uh, video and uh, video games and uh, cinema for the past 20 years, especially in terms of higher education. And so that's it. And I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. And our local, Rob. Thank you. Um, my name is Rob Jeffrey. Um, I live uh, here in Halifax. Um, I've been on the board for the past four years. Uh, it's wonderful to have the, the public meeting uh, here um, in Halifax tonight um, and very, very much looking forward to it. Hey, René. Bonjour, mon nom est René Léger. Good day, uh, my name is René Léger. I'm very Halifax. happy to be here in Halifax. I am of Moncton, so in New Brunswick, so this region, the uh, Atlantic Canadian region and of Nova Scotia is very dear to my heart and I was uh, involved uh, many years in the cultural meetings, so to be part of the um, board of uh, CBC uh, helps me to continue uh, this action and this 
implication yeah. in the, the, the country. Jennifer? Jennifer Moore Rattray. It's a Mon nom est Jennifer Moore Rutchery. Um, I'm a former journalist and uh, currently a public servant and really thrilled to be a member of the CBC board. So, Egosani, thank you so much for your welcome. François. Uh, bonsoir, François Roy. Uh, Good Québec, evening. Québec, François Roy from Quebec, uh, uh, born in Quebec, I but I live in Montreal now. All of my life and now do some uh, board work, several boards, and I've been involved in governance also for, for many, many years. So happy to be here. Sandra. Good evening, everyone. It's so such a pleasure to be here in Halifax. My name is Sandra Singh. I'm a public administrator with local government in British Columbia, and I spent the balance of my career uh, leading public libraries. And Marie. My name is Marie Wilson. I live in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. I've lived in Northern Canada for about 40 years now. I spent most of my career, in fact, within the CBC as a programmer for many years and as a senior manager, and um, most recently was one of the commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Thank you all. So the, the one person that we're missing is uh, Harley Finkelstein. Unfortunately, Harley couldn't uh, be here. Harley is the chief operating officer of Shopify, a, a company that specialized in electronic commerce, and he's based in Ottawa. And maybe just a word about myself. Uh, I was formerly a newspaper publisher and, and now the principal of, of Bishop's University in Sherbrooke, Quebec. I, I wanted to have each of the members present themselves so that you would see, as, as, as you did, how the board comes from across the country they have very different skills and expertise, but I think it's fair to say that, that we all share a common belief in the importance of the public broadcaster and that we're honored to have this responsibility to represent Canadians on the board of the CBC. It's a bit hard for me to believe uh, that Catherine Tate became our president CEO not quite a year ago. She is the first president of the corporation to have a background in creative production and with apologies for the pun, I would say it shows. <laughs> Catherine hit the ground running uh, last July and has, I'm not sure she stopped to take a breath uh, since then. Uh, she is passionate about Canada and the role of our public broadcaster. She has, I would say, the vision and drive and determination of a successful entrepreneur and the social intelligence of, of a truly great leader. So we're very, very fortunate to have her as our president. Dans un instant, elle va vous présenter les priorités de notre diffuseur public. And in a few moments, she will explain the, what are the priorities of your public broad broadcaster in the next three years. One of the projects that are, you know, very important uh, to us and a, uh, some information regarding what we're wanting to do to stay at the heart of the life of every Canadian. So please give a warm welcome to Catherine Tate. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for those kind words, and thank you. I should just say we have an amazing board of directors. I am so happy to have all these people Hello, around me. Welcome to CBC Radio Canada's annual public meeting. I'm so delighted to be here with all of you in Halifax and for those of you online. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's been a year minus two weeks since I joined CBC Radio Canada. And over the past 12 months, I have traveled across the country to hear what Canadians think about their public broadcaster. In fact, I'm just coming back from Western Canada and the North, where I had the pleasure of meeting local leaders, creators, audience members from Vancouver, Calgary, Regina, and Yellowknife. And at Yellowknife, I was particularly touched by the friendship expressed by the national chief of the Dene Nation, Norman Yakalea, and how specifically CBC plays a central role in our country's reconciliation commitment to all Indigenous peoples. This is the kind of thing that we learn when we go on the road at CBC Radio-Canada. 
Partout, les Canadiens m'ont parlé de la grande place qu'occupe. Everywhere, I, Canadians have spoken to me about the great place that the public broadcaster plays in their life. Our relation to them cannot be taken for granted. It is something to cherish and foster. It is especially to develop this emotional bond with audiences that last May that we have prepared and launched our new strategic plan. Your stories taken to heart. Et en, et en français. Et CBC, Radio-Canada's new strategic plan, which launched a few weeks ago, is focused on re-energizing and amplifying our relationship with you, our audience. Most of all, it's about strengthening the emotional attachment Canadians have with their public broadcaster. After all, we know that over 70% of Canadians consider CBC Radio-Canada the most trusted media brand in the country. With over 20 million Canadians visiting our platforms each month, we recognize that this trust is our most precious asset, critical to civic and civil discourse, essential to our democracy. Pages. <laughs> Looking ahead, we're committed to putting audiences first. More than ever, we will create audience-driven and tailored content that connects, connects Canadians to their communities, to the country, and to the rest of the world. CBC Radio-Canada's proximity to Canadians is our competitive strength. We know Canada, we know our creators, and we want to ensure that we bring their voices to the world. We're also committed to building a lifelong relationship with Canadians. This means investing in children and youth with more content that reflects their realities. It also means strengthening our services in local communities, like this one, and to traditionally underrepresented groups. So to that end, we recently announced that CBC Radio-Canada, I'm very proud to say, has achieved gender parity across all its commissioned programming. And by 2025, we have set as a new diversity goal that at least one creative position, and that's a producer, a director, a writer, a showrunner, or a lead performer, will be held by a person from a diverse background in all our commissioned programs. This commitment to diversity is just one of the ways we differentiate the public broadcaster from other media companies. And we've done so already in Halifax with Digstown. Enthusiastic applause for Digstown! <laughs> Last night, last but not, certainly not least, we want to strengthen our role as Canada's most trusted media brand. Our commitment to maintaining quality and integrity in our news and our current affairs programming is unwavering. Transparency, fair and balanced coverage. We will be a beacon for truth and trust in the face of an information disorder, or could I say, an, an information cacophony that puts our democracy at risk and respect for different perspectives at risk. This is the promise of your public broadcaster. With our new strategic plan, we will continue to be the champion for Canadian voices and storytelling, and as Michael said, an engine for creativity and diversity. And the regions of Canada, like Atlantic Canada, are where some of our greatest storytellers come from. I know this from personal experience as a producer here in Halifax. Merci de, beaucoup d'être venu ici ce soir. Je suis très contente de répondre à vos questions et d'entendre ce qui est important pour vous. Plus nous vous connaissons, mieux nous pouvons vous servir. Thank you for coming out tonight and spending this time with us. Thank you very much for having come with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Merci beaucoup. And I did give a little cheer when I heard the news about Digstown going into <laughs> season two. I think it's fantastic. It's great. <laughs> it's great to see Halifax Dartmouth and especially Dartmouth represented in that show. We're going to move on to the portion of our annual public meeting where we address some of the questions that we received online in advance of tonight, the Ask Me Anything uh, portion of the night. There are a lot of points to focus on as Catherine touched on some of them and Michael as well in the new strategic plan. How do you decide what media you consume? Is it around issues? of trust? How do we build our connection with local communities and regional communities and strengthen some of those connections we already have? 
And how do we bring and build lifelong relationships with younger audiences in particular? And I know we'll hear a little bit more about that later tonight. Et ces questions nous ont été envoyées par des téléspectateurs, des auditeurs de CBC Radio-Canada au cours des dernières semaines. Merci beaucoup à ceux qui Commençons sans, pla bien, sans plus tarder. Uh, so, we will speak ça. about les all these questions. The people in the room will be able to ask questions a little bit later. And so, we're going to remind you the, what are the hashtags is a CBC APM for those who wants to comment as, yeah, so well, as into, the evening a progresses. Of, oh, there's a couple of questions. We'll get back okay. to those in a moment. <laughs> We're going to just dive into it right now with some of the questions. They are around a couple of themes. And the first one is building relationships with audiences and putting audiences first. This question comes to us for Barbara Williams, our executive vice president, from Phil. And he emailed us wanting to know how we're making sure that our platforms keep improving to improve user access to them and the way we access them in terms of accessibility full stop. So what are some of the ways that we are doing that, Barbara? It's a great question and thanks to Phil for the question and thank you to all of you for being here this evening. We are more and more at the CBC extending our content across more and more platforms so that we can reach more and more people in the ways they want to reach us. So it is about, is that me doing that? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not moving hardly <laughs> at all, but I will slow right down and switch to a handheld. Thank you very much. Stop moving. What a crazy idea. So uh, as we continue to move our content across all of those platforms, we, we know it's increasingly important that people are able to personalize their experience on those platforms and find what they're looking for when and where they want it. And so we have to be continuously improving the tools so that those platforms work better and better for people. And here's a couple of examples. Think of if you go to GEM, which first of all is a place for you to catch up on all your great CBC content if you didn't catch it when it went to air the first time. Gem needs to be smarter and smarter so it keeps track of what you watched and, and when you last saw it and did you leave the episode halfway through and can we recommend something else for you that you would like. So Gem needs to be a smarter and smarter platform for you. We're starting to develop a lot of radio on demand which in some ways takes us way, way back to the past but we've reinvented it for the future and now you can find your favorite radio programs also on demand on the Listen app and we're developing a whole new set of content on podcasts. So again, we're finding new kinds of content on, on new platforms for you to find. We're making sure that on, our, on the feed, when you're just uh, scrolling through on cbc.ca, that you can find your local stories, you can personalize your feed to really suit where you are and the kinds of stories you're interested in, and that becomes more and more important for people over time. And then in very specific ways, we're going to improve platforms to, to reach people better. So an example would be uh, one of the things we're really focused on is the election, the national election this fall. We have a CBC News app, which has always done a marvelous job, actually, at tracking election data for people. But this year, on election night, you'll be able to go to the CBC News app, to the election section. You'll be able to sign in with your postal code, and it will deliver to you constantly an update of what's happening in your riding so that you can track exactly what's going on in your riding through election night. So these are all ways of constantly improving and updating our platforms and being sure we personalize them so that more people can have more access to more of our great content more of the time and now I'll stop moving. <laughs> all access all the time. Thank you very much, Barbara. We're already seeing that some major advances, ha progress happening. That's, our, that's already happened. The next qu question is for uh, Catherine Tate. Uh, lately, we've been seeing lots of collaboration between CBC and Radio Canada. And we have questions in Vancouver is, uh, asking, what are these concrete examples? How is how are CBC and Radio Canada? That's a mate, it's a great family, but they're two separate entities. How are what are they doing to work better together? It's great that you're saying that we're a great family. Uh, well, Radio Canada and CBC are separate, but we are finding, trying to find ways to work together. I'll give you a few examples. For example, in terms of the digital media, gives us the, uh, the opportunity to share news articles and also do translations on our platforms. 
We share content between uh, uh, Two Point TV and GEM, uh, both platforms. We know that young people, well, on both sides, actually French and English, they would like to see more content in both languages. So we're trying to add this time of this type of choice for our younger audience. We've always worked together for major events that really gather people, the Olympics, for example, well, especially elections as well. Many, There are many uh, things that we can do as a public broadcaster to play that role of uh, the great gatherer for all Canadians. I don't know if Michel wants to add something to that. I think the challenge is to respect each of our markets, but at the same time when you have common interests to work together, to offer a, a, a product that's a much better quality. Quality. We do this every day in the coverage that we do in all stations. The CBC teams and Radio Canada teams work together so that we can share resources and work better together. It's true. It's a true uh, partnership every, every day. In working in a newsroom, I can confirm all that. Oftentimes, journalists, French-speaking and English-speaking journalists, work collaboratively. Not just it's not to do two things. It's the same thing, but to uh, to work synergistically. Uh, uh, Michel Bissonnette, the next question is for you. And I think there's quite a few French speakers in the Atlantic region that will feel touched by this question. It's been being asked by Michael in Alberta. How can we plan, how can we better organize coverage to feel that Francophones outside of Quebec, in a in minority uh, setting, uh, really have their, their, their put place? Thank you for answering that question, Michael. Over the 20 stations, Radio Canada produces content in French across the country. There are 12 found outside of Quebec in minority French language areas. And I say this almost every day, if Radio Canada was not president outside of Quebec, uh, it would it would be hard to do complete our mandate so that we can ensure better uh, local coverage and it is reflected in the national shows the first r rule is to be relevant in your own local market it's a question of being close to your market uh, journalistic rigor to well to know your community well and the other challenge we have as a network is how we can over our uh, national uh, shows to reflect the no, regional realities so that we can hear the accents from all across the country. The Albertan accent is just as nice as the Acadian accent, as nice, which is as nice as the Quebec accent. Uh, this question has to do with building a lifelong relationship with Canadians. Uh, we've recently added the CBC Kids platform on our website, which is uh, starting a little earlier. But it has to do with keeping our audiences with us through all stages of their lives. And this one comes to us from Steve from Moncton, where Karine is from. And it's for you, Michael Goldblum. You have just wrapped up your first year as chair of the board of directors for CBC Radio Canada. Uh, what do you see as the challenges ahead in your next year? Well, the board plays a number of roles. The, the first is to participate in the process of creating a strategic plan for, the, for CBC Radio Canada and ultimately approving it. And that's what the board's been working on. And I think we have a really strong plan going forward. We will always have a role on behalf of Canadians to make sure that the, the tax dollars that Canadians spend uh, in supporting CBC are well spent. But I think our biggest challenge in this next year is um, flows from what Catherine said. We know that, that Canadians have high trust for CBC as a news organization. And we're in an era where the private news organizations are facing some of the greatest challenges they've ever faced. And it's my view, um, I think it's shared by the senior administration of the CBC and the board, that this is a unique uh, time for the CBC to ensure that we continue to lead the way in providing quality journalism, uh, news and information that people can rely on, that they can trust. Um, so I think that's our biggest challenge as an organization, to continue to live up to that confidence that Canadians are expressing in the work that our journalists do. And our role as the board is to support the, the great work of our news organization. It's certainly a trust that we need to earn uh, every day as soon as we get up and the last thing uh, before we go to bed. 
This question's for Barbara Williams. Uh, it's from Montreal, and it has to do with sports. Of course, we've just seen the Raptors win their championship, but that's at the professional level, quite a different thing than amateur sports. And this question is, uh, how is your commitment to sports reflected in a lifelong relationship? In particular, what about your commitment or our commitment to amateur sports, and how does that fit into the new strategic plan? Well, it, for sure, off the bat, we do know that sports does bring people together. That whole Raptors experience was really something else. And if you did have a chance to watch any of the live, the many hours of live coverage on CBC, it was extraordinary. As it was on Instagram and all the other platforms, uh, it really was a, a countrywide phenomenon. But that said, it is the privates that do those truly big sports events, and that's not where we want to play. We have a very distinctive role to play, I think, in sports, and it is in a couple of different areas. It is in amateur sports, and I'll speak to that in a moment, but it is also to some of the big um, opportunities of the sports events that do bring people together, like the Pan Am Games, like the Paralympics, like the Indigenous Games. Hey, could you just uh, pick up the... Oh, you want me to go mic. back to this? There I was hoping that maybe they'd fix the other problem. Cause, uh, okay, do you want me to start again? Go for it. Let me begin. Sure. So, um, back at the beginning, <laughs> to briefly recap, I would say the Raptors was an example of how sports brings a, a whole country together, and we can do that at the CBC, but we don't do it the same way the privates do it. We do it by focusing on some of the other big event games like the Paralympic Games, like the Pan Am Games, like the Indigenous Games, which are unique to the CBC's coverage. We also do it clearly and hugely with the Olympics, where we really have a very distinct role to play in bringing Canadians together and supporting our Canadian athletes in their, in their success around the world. So those are distinct opportunities that make us different from the privates. But what's underneath all of those great events are the amateur athletes that we are supporting through the amateur sports on CBC. I think it's really important that we give a voice and a platform, and that is a TV vo voice and platform, but also radio and also digital, to many of the amateur sports and the amateur leagues that are being, you know, playing their hearts out every day across Canada, and that even starts younger with, with young kids and families who want to see their kids get involved in sports, and the CBC can be supporting all of those efforts. We actually just signed a really interesting uh, deal with the Canadian Elite Basketball League, which is a Canadian league. It has, I think, seven or eight teams in Canada. And they are where our professional athletes are going to come from in Canada and, and ultimately turn into Raptors. But they're all Canadian players. And we are giving them, um, you know, an opportunity for, for lots of Canadians to enjoy and to learn about and to support. So I think we have a critical role to play in sports. I think it is a very engaging one for all Canadians. And it's a real point of difference from what the private broadcasters are doing. Thank you, Barbara. Merci. This is about our role, and we mentioned it a few times tonight, in terms of the trust that Canadians feel for CBC and Radio Canada, Canada's most trusted brand. We'd like that to continue, of course. And this question comes from Sean in Alberta, who wants to ask you, Catherine Tate, how will you prevent bias in order to represent opinions from all over the political map now? Thank you, Sean. <laughs> That's a, that's a big question, and it's a really important one, given uh, we're going into an election period, obviously. I, I think what it's really important that people understand, all Canadians understand, uh, that uh, CBC Radio Canada stands by its journalistic standards and practices, which are published on our website um, and are regularly updated and, uh, and really become the gold standard for um, truth-telling in this country. Uh, we have our two of our, uh, our two ombudsmen here tonight, Jack Nagler and Guy Gendron. They are um, lonely uh, desk sitters that receive complaints from, from people across the country. Both of them were uh, professional journalists, obviously, and very, very knowledgeable. But they keep, um, they keep a close eye on um, areas where there might be interpretation or, or questions about bias. But I would say that really it is, um, it is the this, this central uh, concern uh, of what we do. When I, when I talk to people, I say, news is the beating heart of the CBC Radio Canada, and the JSP is our nervous system. And, uh, and, and really, that's what we stand by each and every day. 
Right, you don't get a job at CBC without knowing the JSB backwards and forwards. <laughs> Many a late night has been spent <laughs> studying that. <laughs> Throughout all that, we want to remain Radio Canada. We want to be the standard for news so that people can continue to entrust, to trust us. Mich Michelle Bissnet, the last question asked to, uh, sent to us by email. Lynn is, is talks about face news. We're all worried about this, both uh, Red, uh, CBC at Radio Canada too. The journalists, those who are following us, how can uh, CBC position itself to offer education and position ourselves as the the credible media source? It's a it's a great question. Uh, as a news uh, media in general, but news media, what's the most precious thing is the people that can the trust people place in you. It, uh, while people come to consume information on our platforms, on our network, they were they knew that it was accurate, reliable information. When people once people started to go on social media to get their information, some um some information comes from is credible comes from serious media but other information comes from it's well it's fake news and as a public broadcaster we have an educational role so that people can make the diff set the difference between uh, uh, real news and fake news we uh, last month we launched the the uh, decryptors it's on our website the scramblers and so it, it explains how you can uh, establish what is uh, fake and what is true. And, and it's next, in the fall, we'll have a version uh, for the television. We added this because there's lots of ways to, to present this so we can make have our information be accessible. RAD was launched uh, two years ago so that we can handle information, process uh, uh, information differently for millennials, digital natives. Uh, and we're going to do my uh, news of the day. It's a way for younger people to see the news and to introduce them to what is high quality information and rigorous information. Our, what we're most proud of is at Radio Canada is the quality of our news and it's our brand. We have to protect it. We have to uh, raise awareness for amongst people so that they know what is real and what is fake. The next step is we've already established ourselves a credible, credible media source. We have to and now we have to offer some more uh, awareness raising. And we are moving to the part of the evening where you can ask questions. Perhaps you've been listening to this and you have a question in mind that you'd like to put to any of our guests this evening. There's a microphone set up uh, right there where Corey just went over to stand. And if you want to go over and line up behind Corey or where Corey is, we'll make sure that we get those questions to you. The online questions, we got to as many of them as we could tonight, but there were some that were frequently asked, and we'll make sure that those are posted on our corporate website so that you can have a look at them later, later on. These questions you can put to Catherine Tate, to Barbara Williams, to Michelle Bissonnette, to Michael Goldblum. Uh, you can direct them to them specifically or ask the entire board to, uh, to respond to it, keeping in mind that we have about 20 minutes or so. And if you can identify yourself when you get to the microphone, that would be even better. Although I've met this gentleman already tonight, Ali. Uh, what is your question? Welcome. Good evening. Uh, First of all, uh, thank you for uh, coming to Halifax, those who have never been this part of the country. Uh, also, thank you for uh, CBC Radio Canada uh, giving me this opportunity to invite me at this uh, wonderful gathering. Uh, my question actually is started when I entered this building. I was greeted uh, people who were uh, greeting the guests, and I was asked a question. Uh, do you like to have a headset? And I said, what reason do I need the headset? And they said, uh, any translation? And I said, what, question, what language we're talking about? And they said, English or French? And I look, uh, I think it was just a gentleman who was sitting, uh, standing beside the table. I, I said, uh, uh, if I'm gonna say anything here tonight, I would like to see indigenous language being asked do I need translation for indigenous language? And I'd like to see being here in Halifax, Mi'kmaq language being asked if I need translation. That is something I will encourage the board of directors who are here tonight. I will encourage those who make decisions, uh, no matter where you are and what position you are. Uh, I come from a different land. I neither speak English nor French, but I was given the opportunity to learn. It's a doable. 
Thank you for your, your observation. And do you have a specific question about how CBC Radio Canada plans to incorporate and welcome Indigenous language both into our programming and our public events? Uh, not the programs. I'd like to see the language itself being spoken in CBC Radio Canada. Thank you. All right. May I just a answer your question for, uh, for one? Am I allowed? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's your name's Ali. Yes. Nice to meet you. Um, I tell you, we do broadcast in eight indigenous languages. Um, I know there are many more indigenous languages, but those that we, we do broadcast in eight, in those communities where there are people living um, and living those languages. I also want to tell you that we embarked, and I got to visit it in Yellowknife um, a couple, uh, was it a week ago? It was about a, week. a week ago. We are in the process of digitizing and cataloging over 75,000 hours of original indigenous language programming that the CBC recorded over the many years of its service um, to indigenous peoples in, in the north and in, to the Inuit. So I hear you loud and clear. Do I like the idea of walking in and saying, you have the choice of nine languages or what, not 20 languages? I think it's a great idea and uh, duly noted. Thank you for your comment. Thank you very much. If you have more questions, we invite you to come closer. I'm afraid I see folks are lining up there behind the microphone, so start a little party over here. Go ahead and <laughs> introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Leah Sanford. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I was thrilled to be able to get um, a, a ticket to this evening's event. It's my first APM with CBC, um, and it's been so wonderful and informative. Um, one side comment before my question is, it is incredible as a woman in business to see two incredible women in business sitting here, growing up at s watching CBC. <laughs> This was not the representation that I saw growing up, and so it is incredibly empowering and, and very uplifting to see this now, so yay. Um, a question regarding media coverage, the journalistic standards, um, and a lot around that, that truth in news and what we can understand. I've noticed recently CBC doing a lot more around broad-scale education for pieces. So there was the waves of change around single-use plastics. There now seems to be a concerted effort around educating the Canadian public on the very real topic of climate change and, and breaking down those barriers. And I'm wondering where that motivation came from, what that inspiration was, and, and where do you see yourselves going forward with other national and international issues that we all will be facing? Can we go? I can start. Yeah, you go ahead. Sorry. Others may want to uh, pitch in, but uh, I was um, uh, had the opportunity to spend a fair bit of time with our news team in Toronto talking uh, just in this past couple weeks about the In Your Backyard, In Our Backyard climate ch change series that has just launched on the National this week. Um, sorry, I'm hearing feed from the control room at the same time. I'm feeling like a news anchor at the moment. <laughs> And I'm not doing a very good job. Uh, but, but we call that constructive journalism. And actually, it is the opportunity when we see in the newsroom that there is a topic that is just of such incredible interest to people. And we do cover it when a particular news event around it happens. But we know there's so much more within the topic and the scope of the topic that we want to provide uh, an opportunity to just share information and grow the knowledge and the expertise, because clearly our audience is clamoring for and Waves of Change out here was an incredible beginning to the whole issue of plastic in the oceans. And In Your Backyard is a whole other extension of that. I think it becomes something we're very thoughtful about and careful about in the newsroom is that we don't take over the news agenda uh, because it, it's very important that we're listening to what people want to hear us talk about and that we are then presenting facts and we're presenting information. We're not presenting opinion uh, and these are very very fine lines in all of this but I assure you that the conversation is deep and and um, and constant about being sure we're staying on the right side of the line of that and we are looking for those opportunities and they could be in some of the big international issues that you're referring to to think about where constructive journalism can actually play a really important role in our world 
Et faire toute la différence, finalement. Merci beaucoup. On demandera à la prochaine personne de s'avancer tranquillement. Thank you very much. We'd like the people to uh, uh, move forward very slowly. Uh, Michel Bissonnette, uh, there was somebody in the public that asked, in terms of the place of region, you know, people in the regions or in the rural regions, maybe, uh, in their role in the programming, people usually complain that there's not enough space uh, for people in the regions. What do you have to say? The comment is very um, relevant. Uh, I worked. Uh, I work every day to become a better person and to offer a better product. Of course, the the country is very uh, vast. The important uh, thing is to have uh, meetings, local meetings. Even in French, we have uh, 20 French different uh, shows that uh, that are local and that meet the needs of the and every that meet the needs needs of the localities. And so we also uh, have other uh, evening shows, and we want to um, have uh, experts in and uh, various subjects that people want to hear in the different regions. And of course, uh, this is something that we've improved uh, even on international uh, scene as well. So if nobody is going, uh, is, if as a broadcaster we don't uh, succeed in reaching every region uh, with the information that's relevant to them, then we will not achieve. So I'm keeping, we, we keep trying to improve in that. So um, I want to echo uh, the comments that have been made of appreciation for the hosting here and the invitation to come. So my name is Sylvia, Sylvia Paris, actually Sylvia Paris Drummond, get it all out. I wanted to make note in terms of the Paris because I want to uh, say the story in terms of um, our presence here, um, in terms of uh, African Nova Scotian black community. So my family came here in the Loyalist time, back in the Loyalist time, so that puts us in the 1700s here, in terms of generationally being present. Before that, we started here in terms of uh, black presence uh, in 1605 with Matthew da Costa. So there is this rich history uh, that is here. Um, I work for an organization uh, not-for-profit Delmore Buddy Day Learning Institute, and we focus on Afrocentric education and research. So we all know, I hope, that we are in the middle of the decade, the UN decade for persons of African descent. Um, and so I wanted to start with talking about um, our community, my community's presence here, because uh, the venues and the avenues to actually know our true and rich history um, are lean. And the opportunity that may be available with this, uh, which is, you know, um, the Prime Minister um, has announced many, most provinces, I think, have come on board now in terms of the recognition of that. But I think most of us in community say it's been uh, five quiet years, so we get an opportunity maybe to bring some more energy to that. And I'm, so my question is about the opportunity very, what platforms or you know various programming to help to ensure that Canadians know about the presence and the contributions of African Canadians countrywide for us with the deep rich history here in terms of Nova Scotia as I talked about. What what is the way for that to happen and, and how do we understand our commitment to something that has been provided for us in terms of this decade? Uh, and the three pillars that are associated with that in the way of telling kind of the richness of the story. And, and our comment in terms of equity and diversity, how do we, how do we see, how does CBC see an opportunity to do that um, in support um, ongoing? Thank you. For, thank you for that comment. If, I'll take that, that question. Um, it is one of the pillars of our new strategy. We called it... Uh, reflecting contemporary Canada. And what, did that, what does that mean? It means all of Canada. It doesn't matter where you're from, or what your roots might be, it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter really whether you're a new Canadian or you've been here since the 1600s. Uh, the, the notion was if we don't reflect Canadians to Canadians, then we're no longer relevant. And our populations are changing and and uh, we, not only in our workforce do we have this commitment, we need to constantly, and we, we surpass 
um, all of the diversity um, uh, targets that we set for ourselves. But it's really about, as you say, it's about advancing the, the, the knowledge and the narrative around particular communities. And that's why I was delighted to see Floyd Kane at the back of the room there. Um, you know, with a show like Digstown, that for us was an enormously important show um, to, to be able to show um, uh, African Canadian uh, stars um, on the screen in a truly celebratory way, in a powerful way, women surfing. You know? <laughs> I just, I was so thrilled to see that. So part of it is about your community, making sure to connect with the people here in the station in, in, um, in Halifax and make sure you're telling the stories, connecting, making sure that we help uh, young emerging talent. And that was one of the reasons why we made this commitment. And it's a serious commitment to say to independent producers, if you don't have diversity in your show in a meaningful way, we're not going to order it. That's a big, big statement. It'll take us some time to get there. We've made, given ourselves five years, but we did it with women. People, when we started on the women file, people said, oh, there are no women. You can't, there aren't enough. There's no pipeline. There aren't enough women directors. There aren't enough women writers. Well, guess what? The minute we set that bar, all of a sudden, producers started working with women, mentoring them, or women came out of the woodwork. And so we believe by making that same commitment to diversity, we're going to see uh, the same success that we've had on the gender parity side. So I look forward to more stories from your community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvia. This is a question again for you, Catherine. Uh, you make reference to generating more revenue. This is one from the public. Could that affect our brand, good or bad? Um, oops. <laughs> It's a very, very uh, complicated um, question. It, it, there, there has been a lot of um, questioning around it, um, just to be very clear, that CBC, Radio-Canada, like every other public broadcaster in the world, has a mixed financing model. Uh, two-thirds, about two-thirds, a little bit more of our um, budget comes from the parliamentary allocation, and for which we are enormously generous, um, very grateful to the generosity of Canadians. Um, the other portion comes from earned revenue, mostly from commercial revenue um, associated with advertising. When we say we need to generate more revenue, what we're saying is we cannot just rely on, uh, on government. We need to be resourceful and to be making sure that we're looking at opportunities. For example, the BBC earns over $400 million every year in worldwide sales revenue. Um, other broadcasters find other ways. The key in the more revenue story is for every dollar we earn, we don't hand it back to a shareholder. We reinvest it in more programming. So the more revenue that we can make, we'll go back into more stories from Sylvia's community, more, uh, and more and better news coverage of all the local realities of this country. So I think it's really, it's an important balancing act. Um, people are, get nervous about ad revenue. They get nervous that we're going to become a commercial um, broadcaster or a private broadcaster. That's not the intention. The mandate is always primary, and the revenue supports our deployment employment and our realization of the mandate. Thank you. And we have another question from our live audience here. Hello. Bonjour. Thank you for allowing me my question here today. Um, I think it's apt after that previous uh, conversation there. I do agree that uh, you guys have been very indulgent with the federal dollars that you have received. And I'd like to echo off a question that Albert, or sorry, Alberta had asked earlier, Andrew. I, as a conservative, certainly don't feel that you guys are living up to what you're preaching and what you gave him as your answer. You seem to preach the JSP, but what you practice certainly seems to be bias. If in this next federal elections or the elections following, Maxime Bernier and his People's Party of Canada is elected, how do you think you would transition to a PBS model? Who'd like to take that one? <laughs> Matthew Southall. Thank you, Matthew. You know, a lot, everybody in Canada has an opinion about the CBC, Radio Canada, and the news. And uh, I've been in this job, you heard, just under a year, and I've heard from people in all stripes about what they think we should or shouldn't be doing. 
And if I spent a lot of time and my, and my colleagues spent a lot of time worrying about the outcomes of future elections, we wouldn't be doing our job. We're focused day in and day out on delivering on our promise to Canadians, which is fair and equitable transparency in the news. To your questions about, about bias, we monitor, we actually have third par parties that monitor the news to ensure that we're covering um, all parties equally, uh, giving voices and uh, airtime to all parties. And um, we're happy to share that information with all members of the public and from all uh, political parties. Daniel Terriot, Daniel Terriot has a question. I would remind you that you can follow this discussion. You can uh, add to it on social media, uh, RCAPA or CBC APM. Hello. The question is for the Vice President of Radio Canada. You spoke of broadcasting in terms of the regions. I'd like to hear what you have to say about production. How do we support production in region in French? Uh, just as a sub major, a sub question: What is uh, uh, CBC Radio Canada doing for First Nations languages? Uh, I represent the FECAN, uh, the Canadian Cultural Federation in Nova Scotia. How are you supporting production uh, in in terms of TV and on the radio in uh, the regions? You know. As you look at uh, Radio Canada's budget, one third of our employees are people who work in one of our regional stations. Right away, there's support for production that's happening for our news and news news uh, shows uh, and local shows. We produced for out of Acadie the two dramatic s series, uh, uh, Aladrag and Consequences. Um, I, I had uh, we produce out from the West, a uh, kid children's show. We're trying to work with in, independent production for web series, documentaries, uh, dramatic series, so that we can have a significant volume of production not, that's not coming out of Montreal. Also within Quebec for uh, productions that's happening outside of Montreal to support the production uh, industry outside uh, in French. Thank you. And just to let you know, we have time just for two more questions, and we have two people at the microphone, including somebody who's very there relieved. You go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, Tara. Uh, thank you. My name's Tara Tyer. Um, I'm a former CBCer, and now I teach journalism here in Halifax. And I'm very glad that you mentioned the JSP, and I think I've heard someone mention uh, truth telling. Uh, what I see here is very ambitious, reflecting contemporary Canada, taking Canada to the world, prioritizing our local connections. If you are serious about truth telling, about telling fact based stories, what is your commitment to journalism then? Uh, deep journalism, well researched journalism takes people, takes time, takes resources, and it comes down to money. And what is your commitment to the newsroom, to the people who are actually tasked I'll with doing I'll start all this? Going. Great question. We're fighting over who, to, who, to, who gets to answer it. <laughs> it's so important. And one of the things that Barb said earlier when we talked about the deeper um, uh, con uh, constructive, I think you called constructive it, journalism. constructive journalism, uh, more and more you'll see in the way we handle news, we, we're looking to go deeper into stories. And part of that has to do with the fact that people are just getting news, the kind of you know, flash news all day long, and we're not playing in that space in the same way. We really do consider the um, investigative journalism to be absolutely central to what it is we do. We know that our stories can change policy in this country. Um, we, we, today we had a report from, from uh, our head of news at, at CBC, uh, Jennifer McGuire, who's telling us a, a number of instances where our investigative journalism has in fact affected public policy or um, decisions uh, around the lives of Canadians, the school bus um, safety belts, whatever it might be. Uh, the, the key there is, as you say, it's cost. And what we're doing in many cases is collaborating with other news organizations. We have a good collaboration collaboration with Torstar, for example, so we share resources. And I think more and more it does address some of the issues that come out from some of the private news organizations about CBC's dominance or having more resources than they might. We're very, very open to exploring that kind of collaboration. Yeah, yeah I would, 
I would just add a couple things. Uh, one being that there was a, an incredible list that Nancy shared with me yesterday of the impact journalism um, uh, results from the, the work that's done right here in Halifax and in the Atlantic region. Every time we do one of those investigative reports, and sometimes it takes a long time to you see the result. It doesn't happen, the story doesn't go to air and policy doesn't change next week. Sometimes it's uh, six months, 12 months, 18 months later before the system actually kicks in and, and we do see the policy change. But tracking the value and the the impact of our journalism, I think, is key to people understanding how valuable our investigative journalism is. And then I think to the resources piece, you know, it's a constant um, shift that we're doing in our whole organization to be thinking about where are the resources that we get the most impact out of. And as we switch to new forms of journalism, we switch to new platforms, we switch to new kinds of storytelling, new lengths, um, and we include new voices. It's about being smart with the resources we have so that we're always pushing the resources as much as we can to the front end to what we would call the boots on the ground, to keeping the journalists in the regions, keeping the real reporters there, sometimes changing the way the back end production then happens to be more efficient or more effective. But it's about recognizing exactly what you're saying, that if the story doesn't get told from the front end, then there is, there is no opportunity for the long tail and the impact to happen. And so it's about continuously shifting those, resor those resources to keep the reporters uh, and the journalists and the investigative units as strong as possible and reworking what happens in the back end to allow that to keep happening. On the French side of things in the Atlantic provinces, we, we had uh, impact journalists added over the last little while, in the last few months, with this vision of Radio Canada that's uh, really taking its, on its whole scope. This is his last question, so if you can please indicate to whom you'd like to address your question. Bonjour, mesdames and messieurs. Hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for honoring me and the rest of our guests for coming to Halifax, Nova Scotia. I am a Halifax native, just about 20 minutes away from here, so it's quick for me to get here. Uh, my question is regarding uh, the archival content that you have put on CBC Gem. I just did a list. I just did a quick scroll through and checking exactly what you have on your scrolling list. And while it is quite broad, uh, my father was born in 1940, so he, as when he was growing up, there was a breadth of content that was available during his time, during his childhood, through his adolescence, and into his old age, which he would tell stories about, about what he enjoyed watching. And I can't quite see enough of that content in this product that you have right here because I am truly a man of the past. I grew up with the old generational content that he would tell stories about, and I don't believe that enough of our young children and our people today are able to see the content that people would have grown up with way back then, like black and white content, which is like a foregone conclusion. You should see the history that people grew up with and see how far we have come across in this, in this time, we should see what people should have had the grace to see that the other people are just taking for granted. And, and, and so your question about uh, that past content in the current context? What are the choices you're making in terms of what content gets allowed to be brought onto the public forum? Like, sorry, a little nervous, but anyway. <laughs> Old content on this new prod, on this new platform. What are the, what are the, what is the process in getting old content made way back in the old times and bringing it into this new forum so that people can see it for the first time? It's a great, it's a great question, and uh, I'll just say we we're at the beginning. Gem just was born, um, so we're we're early days, and um, now with Barb joining uh, CBC, she's going to take that. Um, uh, that product as you describe it and develop it. One of the things I would point you to is from the vaults. Did you see that show? So that's, a, that's our first crack at opening the vault. And uh, in that one is, uh, is a, an arts program and, and explores music and um, uh, gr some great footage of Sammy Davis Jr. on CBC back in the 50s. So we, we do recognize the value of that archival uh, footage that we have. Um, Obviously, the one the, 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 that footage that is cleared. Obviously, we can't just put anything up, but um, you know, it's it's all about time and resources. It's great feedback. 
Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, just to say that um, uh, those of us that used to work in just traditional linear broadcasting, you always struggled. You only had 24 hours a day, and you had to make choices all the time about those very precious hours of what we would call shelf space on the network. GEM is unlimited in its scope and its ability to hold as much content as we can afford and get the rights to. And, and we're in um, wonderful conversations now about the next round of expansion of GEM content. And there's so many ideas about the directions we could go, older and newer and, and from more from Canada and from other places and more documentary or more fiction or more kids. or more And, and their uh, possibilities are endless. So it's a great suggestion that that's one slice of content we shouldn't forget about as we think about the opportunity to grow out GEM over this next year because there is some incredible uh, work done then and that we shouldn't forget. I hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you who came soir. here Merci tonight. Thank you for your Merci questions. Thank you for the uh, uh, the the upper management uh, and you are, you answer the question honestly and openly it's so greatly appreciated thank you for your, our audience at home to fo for following us if you want to add uh, what some, what you have to say if you want to add some questions uh, you can also do it via social media uh, and and CBC will try to answer the questions that come back most often that are most frequently asked. And I wish you, uh, bid you an excellent and evening. Speaking of archiving, a webcast version of tonight's event, you can find that on the corporate website. We'll be posting that very soon. In the meantime, thank you so much for being here and stay tuned. Thank you.